Good morning, everyone. I think it's time for us to begin. Good morning and welcome to a conversation with N.T. Wright as part of the Provost Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, I'm truly honored to welcome you to this event as well as introduce you to our guest, Dr. N.T. Wright. Most, if not all of you, have already attended an event, I hope this week, with Dr. Wright, so I'll keep the introduction brief. The Wright Reverend Professor N.T. Wright is the Research Professor of New Testament and Early Christianity at the University of St. Andrews, Scotland. Beginning in January, Dr. Wright will retire and move to Oxford, England, where he'll become Senior Research Fellow at Wycliffe Hall. In 2018, Dr. Wright delivered the Gifford Lectures at the University of Aberdeen, Scotland. He was the first New Testament scholar since Rudolf Bultmann to give these lectures. Before you leave today, please pick up a discount code for Dr. Wright's forthcoming book, History and Eschatology, Jesus and the Promise of Natural Theology, which is based on these Gifford lectures. And so let me just show that we have a 20% off coupon for you. And while this book is just the pre-release, and we already have some idea it will look like this, and uh, I will admit I've already had mine pre-ordered on Amazon. So, uh, but you can get a 20% discount if you will do this. And these will be available as you, as you leave. Uh, when planning for this series, I wanted to provide a time for you to hear directly from Dr. Wright about his scholarship in order to aid you in your studies. Our own Dr. Frank Thielman, Presbyterian Chair of Divinity, has kindly agreed to interview Dr. Wright to make this more conversational. Many of you may not know this, but when uh, Frank was a student at Cambridge, uh, he had Professor Wright as a tutor for the Gospel of John and Romans. So this will be the uh, student getting to quiz now the professor. We are looking forward to this conversation. Finally, today is a significant day in the life of our country. 18 years ago, many Americans in New York and Washington, D.C. lost their lives due to evil attacks carried out against our country. If we could, let's just take a moment of silence as we remember those who died and those who sacrificed their lives for others. Please. Thank you. Well, 28 years ago in 1991, Dr. Wright inaugurated the Beeson's Divinity School's Be uh, Biblical Studies Lectures. So it's my joy, Dr. Wright, to welcome you back to Beeson and Sanford. And as I said yesterday, while I believe Dr. Wright has changed a little bit, his student has not. <laughs> so we look forward to this conversation. Thank you very much, Dr. Hardin, and thank you, Dr. Wright, for being here. We appreciate so much your taking time out of this busy schedule at Samford University to meet with Divinity School students in this special session. A lot of us have uh, had a special interest in you over the years, read many of your books. We have a lot of interest in your writings among our students. and. A couple of weeks ago, the students had an opportunity to submit questions to me by email. We thought it would make the best use of your time if we had questions uh, thought about in advance and submitted to me. So uh, these are questions that uh, faculty, staff, students uh, who are familiar with your thought and your writings and your presentations over the years have submitted. Some of them come from some of us who've read your recent book on Paul. Mm -hmm. A couple of my classes especially, we've been reading that book and uh, enjoying it and benefiting from it. So some of these will, be, uh, will arise from that particular book. But Dr. Hardin alluded to uh, this being the anniversary of the 9-11 attacks and really our first question that several uh, Samford staff members actually um, 
had for us uh, is a question related to those attacks, and it goes like this. How should Christians approach the societal evil and suffering that seems to plague our world at a systemic level? Does the Bible's teaching on the new creation, for example, in Isaiah or Paul's letters, help us to think through what our response to events like 9-11 should be? Yes, thank you. And uh, it, it is a momentous day, and I as we all do, I remember where I was when I got the news of what was going on and so on and so forth. And uh, we in the United Kingdom have uh, agonized along with our dear American friends over what happened and what it means and what should be done about it, etc. And all that is public record. And I'm delighted to be able to do this as part of this few days here uh, on this lovely campus. Um, I think one of the things that I reflected on in the two or three years immediately after the 9-11 attacks was that the sudden interest in evil, if I can put it like that, on the part of Western leaders, you know, suddenly, oh my goodness, something evil has happened now, what are we supposed to do about it, told me something about the post-enlightenment mindset which seemed to assume that because we had modern science and technology and modern democracy, etc., the world was becoming a better and safer and nicer place. And that is, of course, still a case which people make out. Stephen Pinker from Harvard has written The Better Angels of Our Nature and another book just last year, whose title I forget, but whose thesis is that with the Enlightenment and with the large-scale abandonment of religion, everything is getting better and there are fewer wars and so on. I think that's a very, very hard and silly case to make, actually, but that's beside the point. My point is that most of our politicians have seemed to assume that we had more or less banished bad things happening from at least our world. And that suddenly when something like 9-11 happened, this was uh, a kind of metaphysical shock to the system as well as just a very ugly and horrendous and wicked event. Um, and I think part of what I draw from that initially is that the boast of the Enlightenment to have done at least some work of banishing evil has to be challenged. And yes, there are some very, very good things about the Western Enlightenment, and uh, particularly the emphasis in Winston Churchill's famous phrase um, that um, he, what, he, what he meant was that talking to one another is better than fighting one another. And he said that jaw, jaw is better than war, war. By jaw, he meant you know, people talking to each other. And it's an English phrase, um, jawing. Uh, better to sit there and, and say things to each other than to be lobbing hand grenades or worse at each other. Um, and, and, and that is something which I think so many people in today's world are signed up to. But when you're faced with evil, what are you going to do? And this is a personal question as well as a societal question. And what we in Britain and you in America and many others have tended to do is to say, well, there's a tipping point. And up to a point, um, we will see if we can negotiate about this. But then the weapon of last resort is the weapon. And uh, the danger with saying that is that um, in Shakespeare's phrase, you unleash the dogs of war. Um, and there is a sense of the invoking of the god Mars, the war god, the god of naked power, the god who James and John wanted to invoke in Luke 9 when they say to Jesus, Lord, shall we call down fire from heaven to consume them? And the answer was, no, we're not doing that. That's not what we're about. And there is this rich, <laughs> rich may be the wrong word, this, this deep ambiguity in Western culture, where there's so much Christianity and so much of the Judeo-Christian tradition and the Isaiah 11 tradition and the new creation and the wolf lying down with the lamb, that is part of our tradition. But at the same time, we have this tradition where we look back to the great wars of the past and we commemorate them, not always with sufficient humility and sorrow, but sometimes with the sense of, yeah, when, when we needed to do the job, we went and did the job. And, uh, that, it seems to me, is very dangerous, and it, it, it can open the door to the kind of worship of violence which then uh, really eats away at the vitals of a society. 
And as I look, I mean, you know, we, we in Britain and I think in Europe in general have a big problem about our beloved American friends because many of us really do love America and I certainly do and I come here a lot and uh, as the phrase goes, some of my best friends are Americans. Um, <laughs> and, uh, 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 but we grieve over the levels of violence and gun violence in your society and I see there's a kind of a continuum there you know, because the, the, the sort of shootings and so on that seem to happen on a regular basis in America we have occasional analogues to that in Europe, but by and large, this just doesn't happen. And so it's one of those things you scratch our heads and say, we, we have so much in common, but why is that so different? And I think that's, that's part of the same question as what reaction should we have? And I think, of course, as I think is now well known, we, Britain and America together, uh, reacted in, I think, a very immature fashion to what happened in 9-11. And I remember saying, sticking my neck out in a sermon in Westminster Abbey in um, late 2000 and, uh, which year was it, 2001? One. Well, two, yeah. That's right, late 2001, early 2002, when, when war, well, the war clouds are gathering. I remember saying, if we do what our leaders are planning to do, we, every bomb we drop will be another recruiting agent for Al-Qaeda. Now. Uh, that was actually quite a modest statement in the light of what's actually happened with the rise of, rise of different um, radical Muslim groups who, uh, who we have played into their hands by enabling them to cast us, Britain and America, together as the great Satan, the Christians beating up us Muslims as we always thought they did. Um, and it seems to me that's not the best way to indicate what following Jesus might be all about. That doesn't solve the problem, that merely states it. So I think that's probably enough as an initial answer. Yeah, very helpful. Are there, um, are there specific things that Christian pastors can emphasize that might help us understand these events? Uh, say a, a pastor who's preaching this coming Sunday, yeah, yeah, a sermon. Yeah, yeah. What would be helpful for a pastor perhaps to emphasize or a text to preach on that might help people think through events like this from a Christian yeah, perspective? Yeah, that, that's a great question, and, and it's not entirely clear to me where one would go with texts because there are texts in the Bible which, taken by themselves, can seem to, to glorify violence and um, to glorify war and so on. I, I think I would want to choose texts which emphasize the ambiguity of the, the overlap of living in God's new creation, but with the old creation still going on. You see what I'm instinctively doing with my body language is making the sign of an overlap. A new age is broken in, but the old age is still there. And the tension between those two is something we all know in our hearts and our lives as Christian believers, that, that we are part of the body of Christ, and yet we know ourselves to be sinful and muddled and mistaken on so, in so many ways. I think part of the problem, and this is not something that you can deal with in one sermon, but would really need a constant program of, of lay education, part of the problem is that we in the West have not thought very much about political theology, because since the Western Enlightenment, religion and politics have been split apart. I've been saying in one or two forums the last few days, the rise of modern Western Epicureanism, where if the gods do exist, they're a long way away and they don't get involved here, so this world just makes itself under its own devices, a kind of a social Darwinian view of, of uh, societal evolution, um, that thereby political theology becomes a category mistake because politics is down here and theology is up there and never the twain shall meet. And that's why we have a lot of catch up to do in terms of how the real God the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the creator God, who has never abandoned his creation, but has always remained mysteriously involved with it. How do the people who worship this God navigate the complexities of their political world? And many people in the 16th and 17th century wrestled with those questions. And by the 18th century, many people were saying, no, those are, we don't need to do that anymore because God's up there. And if you want to visit God, like an elderly relative in a care home. You can go and see him on Sundays um, and, and say nice things to him and you'll feel better, but then come back to the real world afterwards. And I think the major educative task, which as I say, isn't one sermon, but is an entire curriculum, is to rethink 
the God-world relationship. But while we're doing that, to cling on simultaneously, if you like, to the psalms of celebration and the psalms of lament. And, you know, to, to, to celebrate Psalm 72, the messianic rule through which justice and peace comes to the poor of the world, and at the same time to lament with Psalm 137, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? And, and to do those, those two together, and not to try too readily to resolve in a facile way the apparent tension between them. Very helpful. I've wondered sometimes if maybe Psalm 44 and Romans 8 ah. could helpfully be paired together. Romans 8 in some way gives, it seems to me, gives the answer to Psalm 44's profound question about, God, you've been with us in yep, the past. Yep, yep, Where yep, are yep, you now? Yep, yep, yep. And then Ro Romans 8 picks up on that, I think. And, exactly. Yeah, for you, and yeah. and, and the, the quote there from Psalm 44 towards the end of Romans 8, 8 is, for your sake we are being killed all day long and yeah. counted as sheep for the slaughter. And it's that, hey, you know, this is for your sake. This is going on. How, how does that play out? And one of the insights there which I find very helpful is that there's a slightly earlier echo of Psalm 44, as you will know as well, when Paul says that we groan inwardly, sharing the groaning of all creation, and the Spirit groans within us, and that the one who searches the hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people according to God's will. That too is an allusion to Psalm 44, when the psalmist says, um, if there was anything that we were doing wrong, you would find it out because you know the secrets of our hearts. So Paul is already thinking of Psalm 44 back in Romans 8 verses 25, 6, 7, and then it becomes explicit, as so often in Paul. When he does an explicit quote, you can look back and find the implicit bits earlier on. And so that the whole of Romans 8, which many of us think of as a great song of triumph, is also uh, a song of lament. Uh, and that Romans 8 holds those two together in a way which actually has puzzled some theologians. I mean, Kaiserman didn't like the song of, uh, we are more than conquerors. He said, that's somebody else intruding in, and saying that to Paul, and Paul saying, no, no, uh, that's too triumphalistic. And I, I naturally don't agree with that analysis, but I can see that there is a tension there. And it seems to me that is the characteristic tension in which we live as Christians. And if we could only think about that corporately as well as individually, it would be much better for us. Very helpful. Our next question is related to this, and I think came up yesterday in, in one of our uh, contexts where we were talking, but what role can Christians play in politics today? This is from a student. He says, you've been charitable to Christian participation, but but have times changed? Is this a season for the church to regroup and shed partisan ties? Perhaps? Wow, wow. I mean, it's interesting is I, when you sent me that question, the, the, that last phrase about shedding partisan ties um, is kind of a sting in the tail um, mm. because it's not the same as being involved in politics doesn't mean clinging to partisan ties, though that sometimes comes up. And it seems to be every generation, every decade maybe, the church in every place needs to rethink this in its particular context. And the context is very different here in America and probably different from part to part of America. As I come and go, I'm aware of different political moods in the south to the northeast and so on. But then when you think globally, I remember being struck 10 years ago at the Lambeth Conference by meeting some um, Christians from a part of Southeast Asia where the government was uh, flagrantly and militantly anti-Christian and trying to stamp the church out. And the question was, are there any closet Christians in the regime with whom one could establish perhaps secret relations to at least navigate the way? And I thought, that is a totally different political question from anything that we face in Britain or America. And as you go around the world, it will vary. So there is no one size fits all. So you need, we need to recover the basic ground rules, which, as I said the other day, for me include John 16, where when the Spirit comes, the Spirit will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. How does the Spirit work? 
Jesus breathes the Spirit on his followers and says, as the Father sent me, so I send you. So there is always a vocation, a primary vocation, not a little secondary thing for a few people on, you know, wet Thursday afternoons or whatever. This is, this is a major thing, that the church in the power of the Spirit has the vocation to hold the world to account. Mm. That's difficult because sometimes the church, sometimes the world in which we live has been greatly shaped by the Christian gospel and the church should be supporting. But the church has to learn the lesson of supporting without collusion and of critiquing without dualism. That's really tough because we easily get drawn in we're supporting this person's program because we really believe before God and in prayer that this is the right way for our society. And then they add one or two more things on which we may not like so much, but we'll go along with it because we want this person to, to be in power or to have the right decision or whatever. We have to support without collusion. We have to have discernment of spirits to know when to say thus far and no further. And we must critique, we must say no, 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 and no to these policies, but without the dualism that would say, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. Après moi la deluge. The world is just going to hell in a handbasket, and I'm off out of here. Um, and that's a cop-out. And the great Christian thinkers of past ages have known that. So these are difficult things. And we in the West, and certainly in Britain, and I suspect in many parts of America, are just not well taught and not, we, we don't normally think about these things. And we need to. The world is becoming more dangerous. Democracy itself is in peril. Um, and it's a perfectly fair question for a Christian to ask, granted that for most of church history, Christians have not lived in democracies. Are we content just to say that because we all vote every few years, therefore there are no more political questions to be asked? No, that's just not good enough. How we shape democracy for the future, granted that democracy, you know, Jefferson said democracy only works when you have an educated electorate. Instead of that, we now have a smartphone electorate where people send each other Twitter messages. Um, that's not a great way to do democracy. What are we going to do about that? I do not have an answer, but the church ought to be in the forefront of asking that question prayerfully and working towards better answers than we've currently got. Very helpful. One student had a question related to your approach to the historicity of the gospel events in the New Testament and the people of God. Um, without questioning the theological importance of a commitment to the historicity of scripture, should pastors continue to focus on matters of historicity, even in a world where historicity and objectivity seem to matter less and less to those searching for spiritual truth? Very interesting. Yes, a lot of people in the contemporary world are basically saying, don't mind what happened in the past, I just want the, the true spiritual experience now. And, and, and I get that, you know, it's perfectly possible for somebody to feel really beaten up by a kind of wooden, here's what happened in history, or maybe it didn't, and let's have that academic debate. Uh, th there are many problems there, but <laughs> Christianity has among its central statements, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's absolutely central. And if that's not true, then we're all wasting our time. I think of better things to do with my life and uh, my, my declining years. Um, but if it's true, then we need to find, and I've said many times, and I say this to professional theologians who tend to keep history at arm's length sometimes, please don't start talking about God incarnate unless you're prepared to look very hard at the incarnate God. And that means looking very hard at first century Jewish history in the Greco-Roman world of the first century. And I have found again and again, it's actually great fun once you get into it. Um, I remember once preaching a sermon in Litchfield Cathedral. In Litchfield Cathedral, you have a high pulpit and the choir on Sunday morning sit in front of it. Uh, and so you're looking down on the choir and then there's the congregation. And uh, from the pulpit, you can see that during the sermon, the gentlemen of the choir would normally be doing a crossword and so on because they're there to sing, not necessarily to listen to sermons. And one Sunday I was preaching on the call of Matthew in Matthew's gospel. 
and I began with the story of how I'd just come through an airport in Canada where you do all the stuff at the desk, and then when you're on the very last bit of the way to the gate, because the airport had cost too much, they have somebody asking for another $10, and you had to pay the $10 before you could get to the gate. That was, he was not a happy man, because everybody was mad with him. And I told that story, and I said, now, come with me to the place where the River Jordan meets the Sea of Galilee, and you're crossing over from Herod's territory into Philip's territory. And there's this guy sitting under a tree saying, tax. He is not a happy man. Everybody hates him. Until one day somebody comes along and says, I want you. Everything changes. So I, that was my sermon, and went from there. Afterwards, one of the gentlemen in the choir said, Mr. Dean, I have a complaint. I said, what's your complaint? He said, I couldn't concentrate on my crossword today. <laughs> Good. It's one of the best compliments I've ever had to a sermon. <laughs> because history is exciting. Suddenly, we're in a real three-dimensional world. And that's where Jesus lived. Now let's go explore it. And when you start doing that, all the logic chopping about, oh, well, maybe Jesus didn't say this or didn't say that, that falls away. That's kind of trivial, left-brain, second or third-order stuff. Let's get to the big stuff, which is thinking our way back into the first century and what it all meant then, and why four people in very different ways took a lot of trouble. Writing any book is a trouble, but those books must have been enormous trouble to write. In order to tell the story of a wandering Jewish teacher as the story of how Israel's God came back to rescue his people. An amazing literary feat in four quite different ways. And once you start asking the questions like that, I, I think you'd have to be very hard-hearted as a Christian not to get excited by it. <laughs> very good. Another question, and this one is along similar lines, comes from one of our faculty members. Could you comment on your view of the sort of canonical criticism practiced by the late Reverend Childs and others? Does this sort of approach to the scriptures fail to emphasize enough the importance of the historical events that produce the scriptures? Or yeah. is there something here yeah. that we can learn yeah. from? Yeah. That's approach? a great question. And it's interesting because it's not only Reverend Childs, but um, uh, Pope Benedict in his books on Jesus, um, he kind of takes a sidestep from the detailed historical criticism because he says we believe in canonical criticism and it all makes sense together, so we don't need to worry about those details. I'm not sure that Benedict really totally got what Childs was doing, but that's a second-order question. Um, Childs, as I understand him, and I'm not a great child student, but I've read some of his stuff and know what's going on, I think, was concerned to say what one, I forget which Jewish teacher it was, said, that when in a, in a critical text of the Hebrew Bible, in the footnotes you get the letter R standing for redactor, in other words, somebody put this stuff together, that the letter R really stands for Rabbeinu, our teacher, um, that whoever it was put this text together is the one who under God is given to us as our teacher. In other words, yes, many biblical texts have obviously evolved over time and been edited and put together. Luke tells us he's done that, it was studied many sources. But part of being a Christian is to say, this text that we have is the text we live with. Um, and one of the joys of reading the Bible whole, for instance, is that you see narrative dynamics which no one person had in their head at any one time. I mean, the way in which Revelation 21 and 22 forms an astonishing, spectacular conclusion to the canon, was that in the mind of the author of Revelation 21 and 22? We can't tell. But somebody, quite early on, recognized that if you put that book at the end of the collection which is developing, then the whole Christian canon has a particular shape. Um, and there are many, many other things like that where if you don't see that shape, then you can still live as a Bible Christian and get along with what you do see, but my goodness, you're missing out on the big picture. 
You know, it's like going to some great art gallery and simply studying one detail of one painting without ever standing back and just allowing the, the painting or the set of paintings to knock you out as a set. Um, canonical criticism, however, can be used as a way of saying, therefore, all that matters is that you have to live within this story, and it really doesn't matter if it happened or not. Because the point is, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God we see in Jesus and who is active by the Spirit, is the one who created this world, who created heaven and earth, and heaven and earth are meant to fit together. And the danger with the abuse, as I would see it, of canonical criticism is that you step out of the Judeo-Christian world into a platonic world where you say, we will just tell this story. And it's a wonderful story, and we can use that story to live in. Well, better that than some other narratives. But no, what matters about this story is that the reality of the story matters. And the reality of the story matters for us today in the sense that our living in this story can never be a matter of our detached spirituality. It must drive us out into God's real world to do God's real work in the power of the Spirit. So, yes and no to canonical criticism. Uh, we need it, but we've got to make sure it's anchored in that essentially biblical vision of God and the world. Do you think canonical criticism is, when it was developed, especially by Childs, was, uh, was trying to answer some problem in the in the intellectual study of the Bible of the period. In other yeah. words, yeah. What, you've done a lot of study of the, uh, the history of the investigation of the Bible. Mm. What are the historical roots of canonical mm. criticism? That's an interesting question, and I'm not sure I'm very well equipped to answer that, but I see waves of things going to and fro with different scholarly movements. My teacher was a man called George Caird, G.B. Caird, who was professor in Oxford for many years. And when Caird was a young professor in Montreal, he did uh, his inaugural lecture there in the 1950s um, on uh, something like the shape of biblical thought or something, because Caird was a big picture person. And he started that lecture by saying, biblical scholars have done a lot of small scale analysis of detailed problems, and that's necessary, but it's now time to put it all together and see the big picture. There was obviously a kind of polemical thing. That's what he wanted to do, so he was able to tell the story of recent scholarship in that way. But since the 1950s, with the so-called biblical theology movement, there was a whole other wave of detailed study. And I want to say, this is partly, some of us are saying yesterday, partly a left brain, right brain thing, that the right brain naturally thinks of big pictures and, and music and metaphor and imagination, and the left brain is basically the chartered accountant who says, now let's do the detailed sums. And you need both. But many people are attracted into biblical studies who are naturally left brain dominated people. And we need that. The people who write concordances and lexicons and so on, we'd be lost without them. But in order to do that stuff without going mad, you have to be basically a, an ISTJ on the Myers-Briggs pattern. Um, and, and, and those of us who aren't honor those who are, but we want to use that work within the larger construct. But the discipline as a whole lurches this way and that because certain professors get chairs and then they kind of determine the thing and they examine people's PhD theses and your supervisor will say, oh, so-and-so is going to be on your examination panel, so make sure you don't try and do that big picture stuff because you'll get into trouble, or whatever it is. And then those people then get chairs themselves, and so it perpetuates. So I think we just need to keep the dialogue open and not to be too fierce with saying, no, this discipline must be like this, not like that. Um, and I think each generation, again, needs to fight this battle because it is about personalities and about sociocultural style as well as about the subject matter. Thank you. Let's talk for a few minutes about Paul. In your recent biography of Paul, you sometimes speak of the importance of forgiveness in Paul's theology. And in reading your biography, I found that a refreshing emphasis. I think it's because you take the historicity of Acts seriously, where Paul does talk about forgiveness perhaps a bit more than he does in his letters. Mm -hmm. 
What is the relationship, do you think, between forgiveness and justification in <laughs> Paul's theology? Is, the, I mean, and Paul does talk about forgiveness, for yeah. example, in Romans 4, 6 through 8, uh, mm -hmm. in the context of righteousness language. But um, is the reason that Paul doesn't use the word forgiveness perhaps quite as much in his own letters? Is that because justification covers some of that territory? Or wow. what's the relationship there? How long have we got? Um, so <laughs> it, it, first thing, it's always tricky to say that Paul's letters give us a kind of full picture of what Paul thought about everything. Mm -hmm. And my parade example is that if we didn't have 1 Corinthians 10 and 11, we wouldn't know that Paul knew anything at all about the Lord's Supper, the bread breaking, the Eucharist. It's the only places it's mentioned in his writings. But from those two chapters, and quite brief sections in those two chapters, it's obvious that this was very deep-rooted in his theology and practice, that he knew that it went back to Jesus himself, and that it was already vital for shaping how the followers of Jesus understand themselves and express themselves and live together. But take those two little bits out and you just wouldn't know. So likewise, the fact that forgiveness doesn't occur very often in his letters doesn't mean that had he written three Corinthians or two Philippians or something, he mightn't have had a whole letter about it. Where you do find it interestingly is when, for instance, in 2 Corinthians, when he's talking about somebody who's had to be put out of the community, when they are to be welcomed back, forgiveness is something which is necessary at that point. And uh, the Romans 4 passage is very interesting, but it seems to me one of the things that's going on there, though this isn't how it's usually read, is that when Paul looks out at the Gentile world, the non-Jewish world, and sees, of course, as a good Jew he would see, Gentiles as under the sway of idols and hence as, if you like, automatically sinning. Because if you worship idols, your humanness is just going to deconstruct and that's what happens. Um, that the Gentile mission is a mission of saying God in Christ has defeated the power of the idols. Therefore, all that stuff that you've done in the past, God will wipe that out. And that, that whole reality, the Gentile mission and forgiveness, etc., becomes part of Paul's justification theology because justification I see as very much the positive affirmation that God is saying these are my covenant people. These are the true children of Abraham. All those who belong to the Messiah are that. And if you then say, but hang on, they're sinners. You say, no, that's been forgiven. That's been dealt with. So I think that, that's, that's how I would relate them. Um, obviously, there are quite a few footnotes one would want to drop into that, but that, that's, that's where I would start. Very helpful. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to another theological term in Paul's letters, the term pistis, mm -hmm. often translated faith. And uh, can you explain why you think pistis in Paul sometimes means faith or trust, as it's typically conceived, but then sometimes also means loyalty? I thought mm -hmm. that was an mm -hmm. interesting mm -hmm. theme in your book, that yeah. maybe we haven't given enough thought to the idea that when Paul speaks of faith, he has loyalty right, also in right, mind. Right, right. Yeah. I think our trouble here has been, particularly since the Reformation, that justification by faith has been so important. And then in the Enlightenment, and then particularly in the Romantic movement, the question of do I have real faith, and what does my faith consist in, and is my faith under attack, and then within rationalism, can I still have faith granted a scientific worldview or whatever? Those questions have so dominated us that when we've seen the word pistis in Paul, we've wanted it to mean faith in our various modern contexts. When you go back to the Greek lexicon and look up pistis and its cognates pistuo and, and so on and the adjectives that go with it, it's got this wide range of meaning, including loyalty, including trustworthiness. And if you then go to the Roman world and look up fides, and fides in Latin and pistis in Greek kind of march step by step together, then you have again the same wide range of stuff. And then you say, hang on, beginning of Romans, Paul says, here I am, I'm an apostle, and here's my gospel. It's about Jesus, the Messiah, son of David, according to the flesh, designated son of God in power, 
uh, by the resurrection of the dead, Jesus, Messiah, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the hupakoe pistios, the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the Gentiles. Every word in this, in a letter to Rome, resonates with Roman imperial language about Caesar, who is the true son of God, who has been declared to be the son of God, it's on the coins for goodness sake, and who now demands your worldwide allegiance, your loyalty. Why? Because Caesar himself has done a great act of salvation. He's rescued the Roman world from disaster or from civil war or whatever it is. And in particular, in the reign of Augustus Caesar, dikaiosune, righteousness, justice, became a goddess. Guess what? Now read the whole of Romans 1, 1 to 17. And in the middle of it, and, and I think it means what it means primarily within the context of Isaiah, the Psalms, etc. But I think Paul has deliberately framed it in order to say into Caesar's world, Jesus is Lord and Caesar isn't. And Jesus demands your believing allegiance and you've got to give it to him rather than Caesar because Jesus has done the salvation and Jesus has enthroned the true justice. So we have to get used to reading bifocally or even trifocally. The really interesting book on this recently, I don't know if you've come across this, is by Teresa Morgan, um, which is called um, Christian Faith and Roman Faith, or perhaps it's the other way around, Roman Faith and Christian Faith. And she does a detailed study of pistis and fides in the Greco-Roman world, and then comes across into the New Testament. It's one of those exciting books which I think doesn't quite clinch the deal. And I've been in correspondence with Theresa Morgan about this. She's professor in Oxford, and I will overlap with her because she's en route to a professorship in Yale, but I think I will have a year of overlap with her, and I intend to have exactly this dialogue. And she points out that in the Roman world and the Greek world, where you get fides and justitia in Latin, or pistis and dikaiosune in Greek, this is about community formation. It's about the justice of the whole society and about people's trustworthiness and loyalty to one another. And I say, well, actually, when I read Romans and Galatians, I think that's about community formation. And it's about the trustworthiness of God and the trustingness of God's people and their God's loyalty to his people in Christ and the loyalty of those people to Christ. And in the middle of that is what we have traditionally meant of as faith. If you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, Romans 10. Yes, that personal heart faith is the deep root of that utter loyalty. But if you think of it like that, then it can never be my faith over here and then my membership in the church over there. And it can never be my faith over here and then my loyal obedience to God over there. These are divisions which we have wished upon Paul in the last 400 years, and we should repent of that and learn to think first centurily, which is quite tough, but it's exciting. That's related to a, a pastorally oriented question that yeah. one of our students had. How do we avoid the extremes of legalism and antinomianism as we exhort our parishioners to live lives of discipleship? And I just wonder if your answer to this question about faith yeah. is... Uh, that, that's, that's really important, and it's, it's really difficult because holiness matters. And insofar as some bits of some Reformation traditions have implied that you mustn't focus too much on Christian behavior in case it compromises your justification by faith, then we certainly need to find other ways around that. And the church has made shipwreck many times over the years because people say, oh, we believe in grace, not law, so it doesn't really matter what you do about A, B, and C. Well, my friends, it does matter. Unfortunately, when the church has grasped the fact that behavior matters, there is always a temptation for the church to start saying, well, these basic behaviors matter, but then this means that those matter and those matter and those matter. And you end up legislating for all sorts of things which you don't get in the Bible or in the Fathers or whatever, but which seem to be cultural imperatives within our society. Um, I grew up in a family that 
would never ever gamble for money, but played with playing cards, old fashioned playing cards, many, many different games and many long winter evenings we'd play with playing cards. When I married my wife, I discovered she came from a family that regarded playing cards as tainted because they were often used for gambling, which then, as we know, destroys families, etc. And so um, uh, my wife now very happily plays with playing cards. Um, and I suspect that um, her parents realized that that was going to happen and thought, oh, well. Um, but there is, you know, I just, it's a trivial example. But it, that, it's that kind of thing that then you get skewered on. And then young people grow up in that kind of legalistic church. You shouldn't do this. You mustn't do that. You must always dress like this or whatever. And, and then they kick over the traces, and often tragically, they reject the gospel while they're doing it. And so every generation, every community, every culture, we have to have the grace and the graciousness to see where people are and to help them. And this is a, it's a community matter. And again, I don't think there's a one size fits all. I've worked with many different communities in my time as a pastor in different contexts. And sometimes I really want to take people by the scruff of the neck and say, don't you realize you're just being an, an ethical indifferentist. You're just saying nothing really matters, anything goes. And we cannot live like that and still be the body of Christ. But other communities I wanted to say, for goodness sake, lighten up. And, and just because your last pastor taught you that you shouldn't put flowers on the communion table, actually there's nowhere in the Bible it says that. Oh, really? Isn't there? Yeah. Um, um, <laughs> And so, it, 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 so it, it, you've got to address it case by case and person by person and do it with a light touch and with the grace of the Spirit about it because otherwise, you know, you can, get, you can then get stuck. I've seen churches divide on issues which really ought not to divide, you know, one pew in the church, let alone the whole church. Anyway, you hear what I'm saying? Very helpful. Thank you. The next question is also pastorally oriented and takes us in a somewhat different direction, but is still related to Paul. What was the collection for the saints in Jerusalem all about? And what can we learn from it for handling wow. money in the wow. church today? Wow. wow. <laughs> um, I'd forgotten that question there. Um, I have a vivid memory. When I was dean of Litchfield, um, we found that we needed to do some fundraising, cathedrals do, you know, you're in charge of this building which has stood there for a thousand years and you don't get any help from the state or from the wider church, you've got to do it yourself. Um, the local, how, how's the local community going to pay for this enormous historic building? So you raise money and you can go and convince people that what we're doing here is a worthy gospel effort, etc., etc. and you knock on people's doors. I hate doing that stuff. I really hate it. I'm very bad at asking people for things anyway, but asking for money, you know, I'd, there's all sorts of things, hard things I'd rather do than that. So I would go out to these meetings and address people who'd been invited by some person to a dinner or a drinks party or something, explain, and I would come home feeling, oh, I hate this, and I would go to my study and my section of commentaries, and I would go to the two Corinthians commentaries and I would think, you know, Paul spent two chapters of 2 Corinthians fundraising, and he hated it too. It's some of the hardest Greek anywhere in Paul. And he, nev and he never mentions the word money once. It's all, you know that God has been very gracious to us, and it's important that grace overflows in your life as well. And when I come, I want to see the evidence of this grace. What he's saying is, have the cash ready for when I come. You know? um, <laughs> Um, and so, so I'm comforted that Paul found it difficult. But he was utterly determined, because it goes back to Galatians 2, as you know, when Peter and James and John in Jerusalem said, Paul said, the only thing they added to me was, in a spoken pneumonia men, so that we could, would go on remembering the poor. They had come from Antioch with money for the saints in Jerusalem. And I think they're saying, please go on doing this. And actually, it's the wider Christian imperative. In the DNA of Christians is remember the poor. Bruce Longenecker edited a splendid volume on that just recently about the care for the poor in the earliest church. And there are one of the reasons people became Christians was that nobody else was caring for the poor. 
um, one of the things that the early Roman emperors knew about Christianity, they didn't know much about what it was, they knew that they had these funny people called bishops who were always banging on about the plight of the poor. And I've often said in England, I wish our bishops were known for banging on about the plight of the poor. That'd be a good thing to be known for. So it's the, the bigger imperative, but then the very specific imperative, which Paul explains in Romans 15, is that we are all part of the same family. And it's the ecumenical issue of the first century is do Jews and Gentiles belong as family together? And one of the, when I was writing the Paul biography, one of the most exciting little moments that I stumbled into is when news of the famine, the upcoming famine, arrives in Antioch, which is a mixed Jew plus Gentile Christian community, the first thing they think of is, we've got to send some help to the Jewish church in Jerusalem. Now, it, it may strike us as obvious, but in the first century it wasn't at all obvious that a self-contained community in Antioch was part of the same family as the apparently self-contained community in Jerusalem. And the money was the sign of family. That's how it should be. And I think that's what, that's the main thing Paul was doing. So it, it's practical, but it's also richly theological. And it's the more poignant in that Paul's footsteps sometimes seemed to be dogged by some people who claimed to come from Jerusalem, telling his churches that they should get circumcised and obey the law of Moses. Paul goes on collecting money to take back to them. The frustrating thing is we don't know what happened when they got there. There's nothing in Acts about the receiving of the money. Who knows? I hadn't thought of that. I really appreciate that point that Paul had just been having trouble with precisely this community that he then continues to reach out and help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I once yeah. preached on this when I was Bishop of Durham, and there was a, a, a colleague who was passionately opposed to the ordination of women to priests or bishops, which I was advocating. And he came to me afterwards and said, so you're raising money for your theological opponents. I look forward to receiving the check. And, <laughs> oh, no, wasn't quite what I meant, but... Um, <laughs> The next question takes us in a somewhat different direction, and I've just noticed the time here. This has gone so quickly. Uh, this is a somewhat more abstract question, but I think nevertheless very important theologically. What was the role of the temple in Paul's eschatology? Is Paul's understanding of the temple related to Jesus's understanding of the temple, at least as far as we know? Wow. This is another how long have we got question. Mm. Um, Yes, yes, and yes. Um, in History and Eschatology, the Gifford Lectures, Chapter 5, I have set out much more fully than would be possible in two minutes here what I take to be a big picture biblical theology of the temple. The temple as the advance signpost of God's intention to bring heaven and earth together in the Messiah. That's Ephesians 1.10. And Ephesians is temple theology, just like John is temple theology. Very explicit. The Protestant West, often with tinges of anti-Jewish feeling in there, have tended to treat all the temple stuff, both in the Gospels and in Paul, as simply a side issue or just a metaphor. Uh, no first century Jew could ever see the temple as just a metaphor. The temple is the place where the living God has said, I am going to come and live there among my people. And John's gospel says, that is a signpost to the truth that is there in Jesus. The word became flesh and tabernacled, eskenosen in Haman, pitched his tent in our midst. And when Paul talks about the individual Christian as the temple of the living God, as he does at the end of 1 Corinthians 6, and when he talks about the church as the temple of the living God, as he done in 1 Corinthians 3 and 2 Corinthians 6, this cannot just be a vague arm-waving gesture. It means that in every individual Christian, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in the same way, mutatis mutandis, as the pillar of cloud and fire came to dwell in the tabernacle in Exodus 40, or as Ezekiel sees the throne chariot coming to take up residence in the rebuilt temple in Ezekiel 43. Um, 
we in the Protestant West haven't done well with this because if you take it seriously, you're taking three big steps towards something which theologians have called theosis. The, the, the dwelling of God in, transformatively, in and with his people. And the problem about theosis is that people have looked at it and said, oh, that's what those Eastern Orthodox theologians do. And that means that you become less and less human because you become more and more divine. And the answer is, no, that's exactly not the point. If humans are made in the image of God, then the more God dwells in you, the more genuinely human you become, and actually vice versa. So these are huge themes which I, as a theologian, haven't explored until comparatively recently. And when people ask me, as they sometimes do, is there anything you wish people had told you when you were 25, which you now look back? Yeah, I wish we'd got into temple theology when I was a lot, a lot younger. I'm trying to make up for lost time. I see so many themes between what you've just described and Paul's letter to the Ephesians, so many, so many common themes there. Absolutely. Could you talk a little bit about your understanding of Ephesians and the temple in Ephesians and sure. its importance to Paul's theology? Sure. I mean, the, 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 the way I see it is this. In Ephesians 1, um, that great shout of praise, that focuses on verse 10 where Paul says, and you see, I've often said, if the Protestant reformers, instead of taking Galatians as their main text, had taken Ephesians as their main text, the entire history of the Western world would have been different. Because by taking Galatians and by making Galatians the answer to false medieval soteriologies, they were able to leave space for then the rise of an Epicureanism which says, being saved is going off to heaven, which is quite different. So justification by faith is how we are sure we're going to heaven. Um, and then who cares about earth? And uh, all sorts of bad things follow from that. In Ephesians, it says God's plan was always to unite in Christ all things in heaven and on earth. That's a temple image. It's a Genesis 1 image. It's an Exodus 40 image. It's a Psalm 132 image. It's, it's, there, it's a 1 Kings 8 image. It's there all the way through the great temple theologies of the Old Testament, especially the Psalms, that, that Paul is seeing, as I think many Jewish thinkers were seeing, the tabernacle as the forerunner of the temple, but then the temple as the forerunner of what God wanted to do for all creation. Numbers 14, um, God says when the spies are saying we better not go into the land, God says, listen, I'm going to fill the whole, uh, the whole world with my glory. In other words, it's not a big deal to bring you into the land. I can do that. In Psalm 72, the Messiah does justice for the poor so that God's glory may dwell in all the earth. It's like the Messiah when he comes, will build the temple so that God's glory may dwell there. But Psalm 72 already says that the Messiah will do justice for the poor so that God's glory may dwell in all the earth. So there's great biblical narrative of the temple as the sign, the God-given sign of what God wants to do for the whole creation. And Paul says in Jesus and by the Spirit, that's what's going on. And in Ephesians 2, he says, the present sign of that is Jews and Gentiles coming together in the one community so that you are built into this living temple uh, for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. And then it goes on because the temple for the Jews is the, the, the sign to the watching world that there is a different kind of God. You know, when Pompey marched into the temple in, in BC 63, he said, they're atheists, there's no God in there. Well, actually, the temple was a sign that God does not actually dwell in houses made with hands, as Paul says in Acts 17. Um, so that the, the, the temple then becomes the sign to the watching world of a different kind of God, Ephesians 3, that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. And it goes on because the second half of Ephesians is about holiness and unity, the great temple themes. And one of the focal points there is marriage in Ephesians 5. That as in Genesis 1 and 2, which Paul cites, the coming together of husband and wife is itself the sign of that coming together of the cosmos. So Ephesians is the most amazing document. I mean, you've written a commentary on it, and it, it's, uh, and I hope you don't disagree with too much as I've no, just said. it's wonderful, <laughs> yeah. I'm just, um, it's, just, it's temple all through, yeah. It, it's, it, it's wonderful, actually. I, I was just thinking maybe someday I'll be able to revise it and, uh, <laughs> and put but, some of this in because but, I think but, you're right on target. But, but let me just yeah. say this. You know what happens at the end of Ephesians? 
if you have this vision and glimpse this possibility for the church, for the church's political witness, for marriage, expect to be involved in spiritual warfare, Ephesians 6, 10 to 20, mm -hmm. um, because the dark powers don't like this stuff. Mm -hmm. And when they fight back, they don't fight fair. Word to the wise. Mm -hmm. Dr. Wright, this has been fascinating. We have other questions that we haven't even gotten to. I'm sorry, our time is... I've been running away with myself. Yeah, no, it's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much. We appreciate your taking time to do this with us. Thank you. It's and delightful. speaking of Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians <laughs> coming together in unity, tonight at 7 o'clock, Dr. Wright and Dr. Mark Kinzer are going to be having a discussion with one another, a dialogue, I should say, with one another, It'll be fascinating, and I, I'll be there. I hope you'll be there, too. Thank you, Dr. Wright, for uh, being here with us and for this whole week at Samford <laughs> University. Let's give Dr. Wright uh, a hand. Thank you. Thank you.